Morning, good morning, everybody. Good to see everybody. We are uh, going to do things a little different today. So I like to switch things up a little bit. Um, this isn't actually a guitar. No, I'm just kidding. That's not going <laughs> to uh, No, I, we're going to start with, with some, uh, some slower songs today. It's always good to, to mix things up because I think we get in this thing, this rut where we think, oh, well, church starts with this big boom or this big bang and like you got to, that's how it has to happen. It's not. So we're going to, we're going to mix things up. So, and, oh boy, one sec. You, you ever done something and you think you're helping but making it worse? There we go. Yeah. So let's sing together. And, and you know what? Like, just focus on uh, how good God is and, and the words of the song, because they're, they're not just songs that you hear on the radio to, to sing along with, and that you do sing along with them, but there's, there's so much more. They're, they're worshiping the, the God who was, the God who is, whoever will be. Yeah, so let's sing together. Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty, through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior, I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. and crucified forgiveness is in you you descended into darkness you rose in glorious light forever seated high oh, I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Yes, I believe in you. I believe in the virgin birth I believe in the saints communion And in your holy church I believe in the resurrection When Jesus comes again For I believe in the name of Jesus I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Oh, I believe.
this morning. Thank you that we're here to lift you up, Lord, because you have the highest place always in our life, Lord. So we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn around and greet somebody this morning. Tell them you're so glad that they're here. Summertime, some people we haven't seen for a little while here and there. It's always good to gather together, see one another for a uh, or at least a, a couple of hours together anyways. 
few quick announcements before we uh, head into the rest of the service. We had a baby dedication last, uh, last Sunday, and it was just amazing. I just love baby dedications, so uh, we're going to have a chance to see that little one over and over and over again, uh, Sunday by Sunday, and we'll, that's the nice part about having baby dedications. You get to see them grow from tiny, and as they get older and older, uh, is always so great. So uh, when you get a chance to see uh, uh, this uh, new little one uh, from week to week, make sure that you, you know, just make sure you, you make her feel welcome. Uh, every single Sunday. Uh, we have a games night coming up next Saturday night. Next Saturday night from 6 till 9 here at the building. Uh, we're going to be gathering together, so bring a board game if you want to. If you're into playing uh, uh, cards, you're going to get beat bad in Euchre, I tell you that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I shouldn't say that because you never know how it's going to turn around, right? So, uh, but yeah, we'll have cribbage and different things like that going on. Uh, and uh, so just bring your favorite game and just bring your family and spend the, the, the evening together, 6 till 9 here at the building, okay? Uh, there is going to be a bit of a vacation for Jim and Claudia. They're going to be heading away for a well-deserved time away this, uh, this coming three weeks in a row here. So next Sunday, we're actually going to have uh, Dan Kim, who's uh, one of our very own, who's going to be sharing the word with us this, uh, next Sunday. Uh, and then uh, for the next two Sundays, Jim and Claudia are going to be away as well. Uh, so keep them in your prayers as they, uh, as they take a bit of a, a vacation. And, uh, uh, and then I don't think I have any other announcements that I need to make. Anything I should be doing? No? Okay. So we are going to have uh, junior youth here this morning. So if your children are of that age, then you can go with, uh, uh, with Ben and his crew. And children's ministry is uh, all the kids are released right now. Oh, yes, Val? For, for the games night, you're talking about bringing something? We're just going to have snacks. If you just want to provide, we're, we're going to bring a few, but if you want to bring some of your favorite snacks, uh, as long as you're into sharing, that's okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to ask Rob uh, Brody to come, and he's going to share the word with us this morning. Wow, I thought that was, I thought that was applause for a minute there. No. Good morning. So, this is John 4. It's a little lengthy, so I hope I don't bore you. But it's 4, John 4, 4 through 42. Now, he, and that's Jesus, had to go through Samaria. So, he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank for it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up into eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is your, not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews, sorry, you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, 
Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know, and we worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and it has now come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it is still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes, look at the fields, they are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life, so the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus saying, one who sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you have said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Thank you, Rob, for that very clear uh, reading of our text today. It's good to see everybody. Um, wow, it's kind of like when we conceived of this series and then launched it eight weeks ago. I mean, holy smokes, where's the time going? It just seemed like eight weeks. That's a chunk, right? I mean, that's a pretty long period of time, and here we are. If you followed along on the show itself, episode eight uh, has now concluded, and we're concluding this series with uh, actually one of my favorite accounts in all of Scripture, and it's one of those accounts where you really can't just grab, well, you can grab a chunk because there's a lot to learn in almost anything that's in it, but uh, to hear the whole thing in one coherent stream is very useful for appropriating uh, what's in there and what the Bible would teach us uh, about our Lord Jesus. And I've called this message, Come Thirsty, and uh, well, for obvious reasons. In a moment, uh, we're going to kick things off with a clip uh, from a movie called Patch Adams, which is at least 20 years old. The lead role is, is played by Robin Williams, and he's a very unconventional healer, which kind of reminds me, in a way, of uh, somebody that we follow, who is also an unconventional healer and criticized by uh, the ones, the establishment, uh, the authorized and credentialed people who actually know what they're doing. And uh, there are so many parallels in this movie to what I think about uh, the Christian walk should be, and, um, and the church. Uh, there's a, a clip, we're not going to show it, but there's one scene in particular fairly early in the movie where uh, a number of interns are in the hospital, and uh, a doctor is putting them through the rounds, and they approach a, a woman, she's on a, on a, on a gurney, and uh, she's obviously in distress, afraid, nervous, 
And uh, they, they stand around her. The, the doctor brings them all in close and describes some of the symptoms that she's experiencing and then, you know, asks them to offer their diagnosis. And almost as though she isn't even there, they start uh, offering these very dire diagnoses. And you can see her concern grow. And, uh, and uh, Patch Adams is there in the group. And after they offer up all their information about what her condition might be, uh, the doctor says, does anybody else have any questions? And Patch Adams says, I do. What's her name? And he asks the woman her name and touches her on the arm. And it's a comforting and healing moment for her. And, and I thought, yeah, people, people, you know, we're more than our diseases. We're more than the logistics and medicine and all of these things. There's people with souls that, that need a touch from the Lord. In this particular clip, though, uh, Patch is being brought in front of a medical tribunal uh, for practicing medicine without a license. So uh, if you're ready to go with that, James, let's run that now, and then we'll resume uh, our message. Hunter Adams. You've been accused of practicing medicine without a license. It's a very grave charge, son. Are you aware that it's unlawful to practice medicine without a medical license? Yes, sir, I am. Are you aware that running a medical clinic without the proper licensing can place both you and the public in a great deal of danger? Is a home a clinic, sir? If you are admitting patients and treating them, physical location is irrelevant. Yes, sir. Will you define treatment for me? Yes, treatment would be defined as the care of a patient seeking medical attention. Have you been treating patients, Mr. Adams? Well, sir, I live with several people. They come and go as they please. I offer them whatever help I can. Mr. Adams, have you or have you not been treating patients at your ranch? Everyone who comes to the ranch is a patient, yes. And every person who comes to the ranch is also a doctor. I'm sorry. Every person who comes to the ranch is in need of some form of physical or mental help. They're patients. But also every person who comes to the ranch is in charge of taking care of someone else. Whether it's cooking for them, cleaning them, or even a simple task as listening. That makes them doctors. I use that term broadly, gentlemen, but is not a doctor someone who helps someone else? When did the term doctor get treated with such reverence as, oh, right this way, Dr. Smith, or, excuse me, Dr. Scholes, what wonderful foot pads, or, pardon me, Dr. Patterson, but your flatulence has no odor. <laughs> At what point in history did a doctor become more than a trusted and learned friend who visited and treated the ill? Now, you ask me if I've been practicing medicine. Well, if this means opening your door to those in need, those in pain, caring for them, listening to them, applying a cold cloth until a fever breaks. If this is practicing medicine, if this is treating a patient, then I am guilty as charged, sir. Did you consider the ramifications of your actions? What if one of your patients had died? What's wrong with death, sir? What are we so mortally afraid of? Why can't we treat death with a certain amount of humanity and dignity and decency and, God forbid, maybe even humor? Death is not the enemy, gentlemen. If we're going to fight a disease, let's fight one of the most terrible diseases of all, indifference. Now, I've sat in your schools and heard people lecture on transference and professional distance. Transference is inevitable, sir. Every human being has an impact on another. Why don't we want that in a patient-doctor relationship? That's why I've listened to your teachings, and I believe they're wrong. A doctor's mission should be not just to prevent death, but also to improve the quality of life. That's why you treat a disease, you win, you lose. You treat a person, I guarantee you, you win, no matter what the outcome. Now here today is... It's a pretty good picture at one point of the church there. You know, that, that every... Doc, every patient, you know, everyone who comes there is a patient, but everyone who comes there is also a doctor. And the church, the unto one another. Philosophically, there's things I could pick 
uh, apart with, uh, I believe, that death is an enemy, for example. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, something to think about there in the church, and it, it reminds me of Matthew 9, where Jesus says, it's in your notes, Jesus shot back, who needs a doctor, the healthy or the sick? Go figure out what this scripture means. I am after mercy, not religion. I'm here to invite outsiders, not coddle insiders. And of course, Patch Adams says, you treat a disease, you win, you lose. Uh, you treat a person, I guarantee you'll win, no matter what uh, the outcome. And I think that's sometimes where we miss the boat in our evangelism and in our interactions uh, with other people. Sometimes we're confronting sin sickness and not a person. Sometimes we're attacking symptoms of disease without caring for people, and they can sense it. We don't, we don't see a person. We see uh, an alcoholic or a, a, a Samaritan or uh, an immoral woman. And in John chapter 4, we're going to look at five big ideas as modeled in one encounter between Jesus and the woman of Samaria, the woman at the well. And I think this woman is very much representative of today's unbeliever. I want you to understand that, that, that you know this woman. And Jesus and her, they have some conversations uh, about the, the, the men in her life. And as you read about the fact that she has been through five husbands and the man that she is living with is not her husband, then uh, this, this woman is very typical I think about hookup culture. I think about the changes in the family and in our, in our society today. I'm not standing in judgment or condemning her or anyone else in particular when I say that. At this point, let it stand simply as an observation. But she is so typical of what's going on in society today and with people that you know, people that perhaps you work with, that perhaps are your friends, your neighbors, people who are in your own family, people who are thirsty. They're going from one relationship uh, to another, trying to find something to fill the empty space in their heart. And, and you know this person moving through a series of disappointing relationships and when they don't find satisfaction with the thing that they pursue, pursue or with this relationship or with this person, they move on to another. And this woman's been on a gerbil wheel of relationships trying to find one that would give her love that lasted, love that would be truly satisfying. And as the cliche goes, she has been looking for love in all the wrong places. There's this hunger inside of her, this thirst. And Jesus says to her, how would you like some water that if you were to drink of it, you would never be thirsty again? How would you like to try that water? She's been relationally thirsty, love thirsty all her life. And you know, people you know, and people that I know are, you've heard me talk about what uh, U of T philosopher John Verveke calls the meaning crisis. We're in a crisis of meaning in our culture. People don't understand how to derive meaning anymore as, as church and faith has, has moved sort of out of their radar. And people you know and I know are, are trying to fill a void. They may not be filling it with men like this woman, but there is a void in their heart, a vacuum that only Jesus can fill. And, and you can know all kinds of people like that. And you can have an impact on some lives like Jesus did, right where you are, just the way you are. And of course, you know that as the story continues, she races back to her city, and she ends up being the person who changes her entire village. And she introduces her whole community to Jesus because of what she's found in him. And then they end up saying that, you know, we believed because we heard your witness, uh, but then after they came and saw Jesus, they said, now we have met him. We, we've seen him with our own eyes. Uh, we have witnessed this ourselves. We know him, you know, to be Lord, uh, to be the Messiah. So this is more than a nice story. And if we look, we can find several insights that will help us uh, do two things. Uh, one would be to understand Jesus and how he loves and relates to sinners, which is all of us and then how we might, in some ways, use this as a model for how we relate to people in our culture. So, uh, number one in your notes, we need to enter their world. We need to enter their world. Now, if you were traveling in those days as a Jew, going through Samaria was the most uh, direct route. But 
Jewish travelers very often did not go through Samaria to get to their destination. If Jesus and his disciples uh, had need of or had a GPS, they could have programmed in their destination and found two other alternate routes that still would have gotten them there. But for some reason, John says, he had to pass through Samaria. Typically, when Jews were traveling from Judea to Galilee, they would circumvent this area. It was an unwelcome region for the Jews. Uh, But more accurately, the Jews sought to avoid any contact with the Samaritans. Uh, Racism, othering is not a new thing. And I don't know how much you know about the Samaritans, but the Samaritans actually, originally, uh, they came from Jews who had intermarried with pagan cultures, and they had blended those religions with the Jewish religion. And they had their own temple in Gerizim rather than in Jerusalem. They, they, they worshipped on a different mount, in a different place. And consequently, there was this bigger antagonism between Samaritans and Jews so that generally they had nothing to do with each other. And of course, uh, people that don't have anything to do with anybody else, uh, Jesus always has a spot, a place for them relationally. And he was compelled to go through Samaria, and he stopped intentionally at this famous well of Jacob outside of Sychar. And if you want to read a little bit more about that, you can actually go back to the very first book in the Bible. You go back to the book of Genesis in Genesis 33 and read about the Jewish patriarch Jacob who purchased this land for a hundred pieces of silver and consecrated a well there. This is not a coincidental rest stop. For Jesus. Even the meeting place has meaning. Jesus is very familiar with Jacob. He's extremely familiar with Jacob's well and the history. But I believe that Jesus deliberately enters the world of the Samaritans in order to reach them. And I believe he deliberately goes into their world and speaks into the life of this woman. It's not socially safe for him. It's not easy for him to go there. Even the disciples, when they come back and see him talking with the Samaritan. Uh, particularly a a Samaritan woman, they're like, what are you doing, man? Like, Jesus knew their thoughts. But he leaves his circle of comfort, and he enters what we could call the zone of the unknown. And Jesus teaches us to step outside of our circle, which means we've got to get out of our comfort zone from time to time and enter that zone of the unknown. But that risk is what evangelism is all about. And... You know, one of the things that we have to realize is, is Jesus was always going. He didn't, just, uh, he didn't just remain at the temple gates. He was always going, always meeting, always having contact with the other person. And, you know, they, they don't plan, for you and I, they don't plan to enter our world. Uh, today's unbeliever doesn't plan to, to check out a church anytime. You've got to go into their world. But the good news is this. You are in their world most of the time, in your interactions, in your society, in your neighborhood, in in, in your workplace. So we're going to have to reach them in settings where they are comfortable. And so the new front lines of evangelism are are, are more likely to be uh, the living room in your home or the kitchen with one or two other couples. Uh, it, It may be your neighborhood. It may be your own family. It probably won't be among the stained glass and the organ and the choir music. We need to go where they are, and you're already there. God has strategically placed you in a relationship with somebody that you can reach. And you don't have to get weird about it. It, it, You know, it doesn't have to be a project. It's a person. It's a person. We enter their world. Evangelism that doesn't expect them to come to ours. We go to theirs. We cross the street, and we remove barriers. Jesus was an awesome example at dismantling barriers, societal societal barriers, religious barriers in the, in the Judy, uh, Jewish faith. Jews were not supposed to speak to Samaritans. They hated each other. Men were not supposed to speak to women, but Jesus crossed those lines. Religious leaders, by the way, usually crossed the street uh, to avoid women like this. You see, religion is all about, here's a word we know far too well right now, uh, or or over the past couple of years, but religion is all about lockdown. 
It's all about quarantine, right? Unclean, dirty, infected, defiled, sinner, quarantined, avoid. You know, doctor comes home one day and his spouse says, how was your day, honey? And he says, oh, I had another successful day at the hospital. I avoided all sick people. I stayed completely unexposed. I met with a pastor a few years ago of a large church in in Indiana, and he shared about a time when he went to a baseball game with his father. And he said they were sitting in this gigantic row of people, and there was a couple, a very nice couple, that, that they were seated next to, and he was enjoying some small talk with them. They were having fun, and, and uh, this couple was having a couple of beers, nothing crazy. Uh, but you know how it is at the ballpark. So the people who, sta- who, who sit at the, the start or the end of a row, depending on how you think about it, are, are constantly having to pass things from the concessions, from the vendors, to people in the middle. You know what that's like, right? You're passing the popcorn, you're passing the Coke, uh, the beer's spilling on you, then the money, you know, has to travel from 10 people down to one end and and back, and you know, it can can get a little uh, annoying at times, but my my pastor friend said his father, who had also been a preacher, a very old school preacher, and that his father had always been really strong and really outspoken against drinking. I mean, the subject made it into just about every sermon uh, the man talked about. He talked about drinking more than he talked about the Bible. Uh, He didn't want to touch beer, let alone drink it. Uh, If you think I'm mocking this man, uh, no, I'm not. I I can certainly appreciate the the, the conviction. But this couple was sitting next to my pastor friend and and his father, and and my friend Derek is trying to get to know him, have a conversation and stuff. He said that the man ordered beer but it had to come through his father when they were passing it. His father stood up, blocked the eye, and refused to pass it. And he told my friend Derek not to touch it either, and he made this huge scene. And my friend told me, you know, he just wanted to say to his dad, Dad, look, just let him have his Budweiser, man. Like, just, it's not that big of a deal. You know, I want to talk to him. I don't want to alienate him. And of course, that was the end. The conversation, you can imagine, completely broke down at that point. And, and I mean, this is an extreme example, but sometimes this is where Christians start. Uh, making a stand, pointing out flaws, getting on a bully pulpit, and everybody knows what we're against, but they don't know what we're for, or they don't understand why we're for what we're for or against what we're against. And, and my dad, friend's dad, he, he kind of missed it. He alienated the very people he was supposed to love. He was... I guess, treating the disease instead of caring for the patient and a three-hour opportunity to cultivate at least some kind of a positive interaction uh, was ruined over a 12-ounce plastic cup of beer. Many years ago, uh, an author wrote a, uh, at the time, I think it holds up pretty well. It was a very, very popular book, I suppose, back in the late 70s, early 80s by Rebecca Manley Pipper called, Pippert called Out of the Salt Shaker and Into the World. Anybody been around long enough to remember that book, Out of the Salt? Yeah, I thought maybe that would have been in your circles at that time uh, too, Val. And uh, one of the things that that she said is this. Christians and non-believers have something in common. We're both uptight about evangelism. Isn't that true? And there's a tension there. We want to maintain biblical fidelity. We want to be true to the Word of God, but at the same time loving and sensitive and even creative in relating warmly to the unchurched. So somewhere in between, in the middle of this tension, is where I want to live. It's where I want us to live. I want us, I want us to push it. Uh, push it, like, like race car drivers do. Maybe you don't know this, but to qualify for a race, you have to go fast to qualify. You have to make a particular time. If you don't go fast, you might not qualify. And then if you don't qualify, you don't get to compete in the race. So what race car drivers do is they push it to find the speed. But here's the deal. They got to go out on the edge and it's not as safe. And it's possible that, you know, they, they might even wreck and wrecking is bad, right? But if they don't get a good time, and they don't get in the race, if they fail to push it, they fail to compete at all. I want us to push it. I want us to live 
and get comfortable living in the edge of this tension. I don't want us to compromise the truth. I'd give my life for the truth of Jesus Christ, but I want us to, to push it, to engage our culture in such a way that we learn to live in the middle of that tension and don't shut right down. So that like Paul, you know, by any means possible, I might reach some. I believe the Apostle Paul pushed it. Pushed it. Now, can you do me a favor? We don't do a lot of call and answer here, but could you just say, uh, push it, Jim? One, two, three. No, you push it. You push it. Number two, reach out to one. Reach out to one. Isn't it interesting? Now, there turns out to be this major revival in Samaria, but it starts when Jesus goes into Samaria and goes out of his way to make contact. Look at verse 7 in your notes. When a Samaritan came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? Scandalous. But what does Jesus do? He reaches out. He goes after one. Do you know that there are over 100 billion galaxies that have been discovered? Do you know that there are over 7 billion people on the earth? Do you know what God's favorite number is? One. One. The creator of hundreds of millions of galaxies and people, and God's favorite number is one. Jesus called the followers one at a time. The shepherd will leave the 90 and the 9 to go after one. He will go to Samaria to find the one. He will have the time for one thief on the cross to have an agonizing conversation. The crowd presses in on him, and he will stop for one woman who comes and lunges to touch the hem of his garment and says, if I could just touch Jesus. He talks to one tax collector up a tree, Zacchaeus. And in the middle of a crowd, Jesus' number is one. Is there one, just one, that you can talk to, that you can love? You see, I believe we need a burden with a name. We need a burden with a name on it. You know, we, we're, we're ambiguous at times. God, God saved the world. God, help all those lost people out there, whoever they may be, like these mystery people. No, until your burden has a name, it goes nowhere. Who's going to be in heaven because you took the time to reach out to one? Who's going to enjoy the sweet communion of Christian family and fellowship because you took the time to reach out to one? Who's that person for you? Would you just begin with one person for whom you would lay down your life? Jesus goes after one. You remember Andrew? And then Andrew, his first instinct after he comes to Christ is what? To run and get his brother Simon. Come on, we found him. We found the Messiah. And he leads his brother Simon to Jesus. Immediately he's got a name on his heart, his brother Simon. One, one, one burden with a name. This, this will change you and it will change and redirect your focus. You know, I've been sometimes to, 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 to some prayer meetings. Okay, I've, I've been to a lot of prayer meetings. And uh, sometimes, you know, it can get a little tiring at church prayer meetings. No wonder sometimes we're not able to get more than a handful of people out. But, you know, everybody gets up and says, well, now let's pray for so-and-so's hip. Okay, now we're going to pray for so-and-so's heart condition. Okay, let's pray for somebody's bladder. Oh, we're going to pray for, the, for, 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 for somebody's liver. And, you know, it's more like an organ recital than it is a prayer meeting. We spend so much time praying about our needs. Uh, 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 what about your neighbor whose life isn't working out? You know, you get tired of hearing about all these organs all the time. And don't misunderstand me. The, the Lord invites us to bring us all of those ailments. And I pray for healing. But the point is our activities, our prayers at prayer meetings should be as much about people who are going to hell as people who are going into the hospital. Where in the church, we can say to one another, Please pray for me. I'm going to be having a conversation with Joe this week. Pray for my neighbor, Joe. You know, he's really struggling, and he's actually opened up a window to, to, to have some pretty intimate conversations with me. Could we pray for Joe? Let's each have a name. Let's take the time to reach one. Now, a third thing we can learn for our text is this. Number three, begin with their starting point. Certainly, Jesus did that when he asked her for a drink of water. That opened up a conversation that led to a discussion of living water, water where you'll never be thirsty again. And from there, with no hidden agenda, no clever marketing tricks or anything, just an interest in and a compassion for this woman, 
Jesus begins to engage her in a conversation about her personal life. And he starts with her thirst. Jesus is offering something from within. And so the woman said to him in verse 15, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty or have to come all the way here to draw. And he said to her, Go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have correctly said, I have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one you have is not your husband. This you have said truly. Well, all righty then, <laughs> right? Uh, can you imagine meeting a stranger that can tell you the details of your entire life story? And that's where we want to start today. What this woman teaches us is that Jesus knows your story. He knows your neighbor's story. He knows your story no matter how hard it's been or how ugly it's been. And he wants to redeem it. He wants to redeem you. Uh, you ever notice that nowadays everything, everything gets caught on camera? Everything gets recorded somehow, right? Alexa, Siri, Google Assistant, they're always listening, recording. I mean, license plate cameras are scanning, face recognition systems are running, security cameras are everywhere. Uh, satellites can capture and expose uh, embarrassing moments or, or fr fr from outer space. Secrets are revealed, crimes are solved, the truth is unveiled. In the famous uh, words of George Orwell, Big Brother is watching. Big Brother is watching all the time. In fact, I heard somebody uh, say that uh, recently. They said, man, you know, an older person, old guy like me, said, man, I'm glad I grew up, you know, w when I did, um, uh, because, you know, I'm glad I got to do all the stupid stuff I did without it being captured on video or camera or recorded. I mean, you know, everybody knows everything today, right? Not that long ago, a tragic drunk driving fatality caused by an NFL player recently in his Corvette, and we already instantly know his name, his blood alcohol content, his speed preceding the accident, the exact miles per hour at impact, the salary number that he's going to lose, and the details about the other vehicle and the woman and her dog who were killed in the vehicle. Artificial intelligence knows so much now, but what it doesn't actually know is the depths of your heart. They might be able to figure out your consumer patterns, but it doesn't really know you, your deeper longings, your hidden thoughts and your motivations. And, and Jesus does. And this should actually be a comfort to us. He knows all about us and cares about us in every single detail. He knew every detail about this woman, her past, her present, and her future. She said, I have no husband. And, and he said, you have said correctly that you have no husband, for you've had five husbands. And, um, you know, the... the and you're shacked up with somebody again now. I mean, that's, that's, you've told the truth. I mean, maybe this woman had just experienced a few shameful breakups in her life. Maybe she'd had tragedy. She'd been widowed multiple times. Perhaps she had made some bad decisions, you know? People do that, that collapse upon them, that cascade into, you know, a, a wave of things that get unleashed. It, it, it doesn't matter, though. Here's what we know. Jesus knew her story, and he wanted to redeem it. And I want you to take that home with you today. All the things in your past, all the things that you can think of in your lifetime, and sometimes we get a little more pensive about that than others, right? You ever have a moment where you start to just sort of out of nowhere think about, man, if I had that to do over or whatever. But, but there are things that trigger us to think about all the things that have happened to us in life. Uh, Jesus knows your story. He knows you. And he wants to redeem it. I love the word of Jesus to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, chapter 2. Especially the church that he addresses in verse 13 of chapter 2. This is what he says, I, I know where you live. Now, you know, by that, he doesn't mean which street address you live on, although he knows that too. I know where you live. I, I know what you've been through. I know your circumstances. I know, I know the factors and events in your life that have shaped you and influenced you to do and be and uh, behave the way you do and, and bring the consequences that, that, that they've brought. I know where you live. Jesus knows your story, and he wants to redeem it. Some of you have heard me tell the story of the 
Christian school that had a cafeteria, and there's a cafeteria line the kids are going through, and the, the school had brought in like these fresh, big, huge, you know, honking bowl of fresh oranges, and they just looked juicy and nice. And um, <laughs> so the cafeteria workers had taken a sign and put it on the bowl of oranges, and it said, please take only one orange each. Jesus is watching. But they would go through the line, and at the end of the line, there was a large, large um, bowl of homemade chocolate chip cookies, and some wise guy had written on that, take as many as you want. Jesus is busy watching the oranges, right? <laughs> well, he can see everything at once. He knows your story. He knows the whole picture, and he wants to redeem your story. He knows your story, and he wants to redeem it. Now, that doesn't mean that Jesus tries to dance around the issues. Not at all. He doesn't try to dance around the issue of sin, but we all need to remember that we live in a society that doesn't acknowledge sin, that doesn't acknowledge absolute truth, absolute right or wrong. You're wrong. Really? Well, you say I'm wrong. Wrong according to who? Wrong according to what standard? So we have to start where they are. How do you present a Savior to people who don't care about sin? Well, do you know what they do care about? Do you know what they do acknowledge? First of all, unbelievers might not acknowledge the sin in the way we've understood it traditionally, but they do understand the pain that sin causes. Oh, they know that very well. They know when they've been wronged. They know the harm that sin does. They know the shame that it brings. They, they care about the effects of sin. They are experts, experts on the damage that sin does. But they don't necessarily attribute it that it's sin that does it. So when someone goes into the doctor, seldom do they walk in and say, hey, doctor, I have cancer. Right? No, they go in and they say to the doctor, um, I I'm worried, I, I have a lump. Or I have this bleeding. I have this pain. The thing that gets them to the doctor is the lump. They don't know what the lump is caused by. They see the symptom, and it's the symptom that opens them to the diagnosis of the disease and potentially leads to the cure of it. And I think our evangelism needs to do that. If we're going to share Christ with people, we need to begin with the lump they can see and then get to the cancer, which causes the lump. Two other things in your notes that even non-Christians understand. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. Something's wrong in this world. Something's wrong in our family. There's just not something that's not right. I sense it. I don't know what it is. Something wrong with my boss. Something wrong with my neighbor. Uh, I, I don't know what it's called, but there's something wrong with me. You know, I, I, I can't live up to my own standards even. What, what, and we know what the something is. We know that sin is what's wrong. And they can sense this. They can see it. They can see it in their family breakage. They can see it in their relationships. They can see it in their loneliness. They can see it in their shame. They can see it in uh, things that they do to medicate themselves or the inappropriate sex. They can see it in all the dysfunction, but they don't know what causes the lump. So, you know, when they bring to you that complaint about something significant in your, their life, it's time to listen carefully. It's time to be present. It's time to take down the barriers and start at their starting point. Now, uh, here's the third thing they know. Someone's missing. Someone's missing. There is not an unbeliever you know who doesn't ultimately know deep down in their heart that someone is missing. Who is it? Who is it? You know, uh, when we were little, we thought it was a best friend. A best friend didn't do it. Uh, you know, we got a little older. We thought having lots of friends and being popular, that would give us that status. That would give us something our, our heart craves and needs, uh, you know, a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Uh, but then a husband didn't do it. Then you had kids and there was still this restlessness within you and something, someone is missing. Do you think the woman with five husbands and living with someone who is not her husband now, do you think maybe she senses this? And I know, and you know, that this is the missingness of God. And that's the only thing that can fill that void. Now back to sin. Eventually Jesus dealt with the issue of sin with the woman at the well. You see, Jesus didn't die 
for our dysfunctional relationships. Jesus didn't die just for our loneliness. Or, Jesus died for the cancer of sin and to save us from the death that sin breaks. Uh, but still, you start at their starting point. And in Jesus' interaction with this woman, we learn his willingness to bring the flow, the flood of living water. You know, death all around us in, in our culture. This flood of living water that is so uniquely refreshing. We, we, it's just our deepest need. And he wants to meet it. See, I'm convinced that Jesus is thinking beyond the details of this woman's life. He's not just thinking about the five husbands. He's thinking about her and the decisions and the background and, and, and what series of events brought her to this place. And when Jesus looks at your life, he does the same thing. He sees your deepest need. He knows why you chase the stuff you chase. You know that most people are chasing something. There's, there's, there's healthy striving, but there's this chase that, uh, yeah, this pursuit. He knows why you chase and what you're chasing. He knows why you've done the things that you've done, and he wants to, to meet that need. I mean, just think of all the things we see in our world and in our culture right now. I saw someone post on social media the other day. Here's what she said. I left the love of my life in my 20s, and now I'm sorry. I'm childless and alone at 42. She's hurting. She's crying out for help. The responses to that woman were just blisteringly cruel. Blisteringly cruel, merciless, judging her, criticizing her, telling her she, she got what she deserved, or analyzing her in, in, in some way. You know, have you ever fallen for quick bait that shows before and after pictures of celebrities who have spent, you know, tens of thousands, maybe even millions of dollars on plastic surgery, and the plastic surgery went wrong? And there's a part of you, or at least in some of us, who are kind of like, yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, like, you got what you deserved. You know, instead of chasing the beauty that, that, that they had desired, they, they, you know, they got something else. They got something like they got what they deserved. And, and you're tempted to think, well, that's stupid. You know, that, that's what you get. Or you watch that gender activist lashing out at the world or the guilty drunk driver who ruined their own life or, and countless others. Or, or the individual, they, they get sucked into a religious cult with beliefs that are completely insane, stories and doctrines. Or the crazy left-wing politician that you believe is destroying everything, or the crazy right-wing extremists that you believe are doing the same, or the, the meth addict with whose teeth are gone and eyes are sunken and half-dead, open wounds on their flesh, the, the militant feminist that hates all men, or the misogynist male who abuses women, the racist who hates brown people or white people or any other group of people. What is it that they're chasing? What is it that has brought them to this point? We might not know, but Jesus knows. He knows their deepest need, and he wants to meet it. You see, there's a, I won't get, it's not in my notes at all, a philosopher by the name of Lacan uh, talks about a, a concept called the objet petit a, uh, which he posits that there's something we desire. We have this in us. We desire this thing. And because we don't get the thing we think we deserve or that we want, we have to find somebody to resent. You're the reason. People like you, you're the reason I didn't get the promotion. Or you're the reason why my marriage fell apart. Or you're the this or that. And, and so whole groups of people get scapegoated, isolated and alienated because when we don't get that object of desire, we need to find somebody to resent, to be angry, to focus that outrage on. You know, like this woman. Jesus knows your deepest need. He wants to meet your deepest need. He knows why you're chasing what you're chasing. And three chapters later in John chapter 7, it says in verse 37, on the last day of the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. 
He who believes in me, as the scripture says, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Okay, quickly, let me give you the two last things. Number four, avoid religious smoke screens. So, so like Jesus did, don't, don't as, 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 as he avoided, don't get trapped into a debate. You don't need to get lost in doctrinal distinctives or denominational differences. You know, well, we do it this way, and the Baptists do it that way, and this group, and we're the right group, follow us. No, no, no. Jesus said, follow me. I am the issue. And when people throw up all those things, when people want to debate, I say, you know, we could talk about that. But what about Jesus? Would it be okay if we just looked at Jesus? Uh, you know, Jesus didn't say, follow my followers or my opinions, uh, their opinions. Jesus said, follow me. And there, there, there's so many smoke screens. He said, you know, we worship on this mountain, but you Jews worship in Jerusalem. We worship in this style, different style. Those are not the issues. Certainly not at this point, if at all. Sometimes we'll say, someone will say, well, my neighbor, you know, is a Christian, and they're just a big hypocrite. But Jesus didn't say, follow your neighbor. He said, follow me. So avoid religious traps. Focus on Jesus. Religion is never the issue. In fact, religion is often the problem. We aren't saved particularly because we have the exact right theology or right set of works. Ephesians 2.9 says, not by works are we saved, we're saved by grace. It's like a drowning man being given swimming lessons. At that particular moment, he needs rescue. He needs a lifesaver. Help, I'm drowning. And we're trying to say, okay, well, here's what you do. First, you've got to learn the flutter kick. And then we'll move on to uh, the front crawl. You got to take your left arm and, hey, I'm drowning. I don't need a lesson or a booklet on swimming. But that's what every religion is. Learn the right works, then do it yourself. And listen, Baptist works don't work. Catholic works don't work. Muslim works don't work. Our works don't work because we're drowning and we need a rescuer, not a swimming instruction. So if I could save myself, don't you think I would? My final point ties right into this. Number five, stress a relationship with Jesus. Stress a relationship with Jesus. In your notes, then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Jesus said to the woman, I am the Messiah. I who speak to you am he. And the woman goes back to her village with this message on her lips. And she doesn't say, come and join a new religion. What does she say to them? She goes back to her village and says, come see a man, a person. Come see a man. Somebody told me, who told me all about my life. Somebody told me all for everything I ever did. He, he, come see a man who's changing me. Come to Jesus. Tell of his wonderful life. He's not your belief. He's not your religion. He's your Savior. A Redeemer. And that's what we have to tell. I bear news today of life's most important relationship. Now, there's a very interesting dialogue in chapter 4 after this woman leaves, and uh, Jesus is approached by the disciples. They, they've been gone doing the important work of buying groceries in the village. And they say, Lord, you know, we, we, got, we got some Subway here. Uh, you know, let's sit down and eat. You got to be hungry. And he says, man, I've got some food to eat that you know nothing about. And while they're saying, hey, let's sit and have lunch, the whole Samaritan village is coming out to meet them. And Jesus says, would you forget lunch? It's harvest time. Look, there's people I want to know and who need to know me. This isn't the time to be feeding ourselves. The, the harvest is ready. The harvest is coming. It's good to eat, but let's not forget the people around us, the unbelievers in your world who need the Lord. You'll remember a, a few decades ago, um, when the big story was the discovery of the wreckage of the Titanic. Uh, they, they hadn't been able to find 
this ship. It was an amazing story, but it wasn't where they thought it was going to be. I remember as a boy reading a book called A Night to Remember. It's still one of the best authoritative histories of, of the sinking of the Titanic. Uh, but history told us that the USS California had been 20 miles from the Titanic when she went down, and 1,600 lives were lost that, well, that night. They sent out distress signals, and the California uh, said they couldn't get there because they were 20 miles away. Well, they had a reading. They, they knew where uh, the California was that night. They had a fix on her bearings, and they would never find the Titanic because they continued searching in, a, in an area 20 miles away from that mark. Well, then they found the Titanic. You know what they discovered? The wreck was really only just five miles away from the California that night. Most of those people never had to die. There were people close enough to save them. They never made a move. You're close enough. You're close enough to make a difference. And so I think as a church, we need to continue to learn to push it, to push it, to live in that tension, always in love, leading with Jesus. Come see a man. Come see a man. The most important person you will ever know. The person that you need to know. The person who can look inside you and replace shame and regret with raging, flowing, living waters of abundance, newness, refreshment, and redemption that's offered to every person, struggling sinners, everybody else alike. And pray, and then I'm going to ask Pastor Dave to come and lead us in the Lord's Supper. Father, we're grateful that you love us, that your Son entered our world, that he knows us, There's so many things we would just die if someone else knew them about us, but Jesus knows them all, and he died for us to redeem us, to bring us life. So, Father, help us to think about people, the sick who need a doctor, to give and receive to one another, but to give freely to those who don't know you, patiently, investing because it's not the healthy who need a physician, it's the sick, Lord. So you pray that you would help us recognize our one and wisely point them to you, the Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks, Jim. Wow. It really just brings everything home, doesn't it? If you haven't uh, already done so, we have communion pods out on the either side of the, of the room on the table. And that's what reminds me of uh, a book that was maybe not quite as old as the book that you men, uh, mentioned before, Jim, but it was called The Man Called Norman. And basically, the gist of the book is that we may only have even the opportunity to reach one person. It may be our lifetime project that God connects our lives together. And, and sometimes we think, man, you know, there's so many people that are out there needing to be saved. But if we just focus on the one, then we can go to the next one, the next one. But we've got to focus on the one. And I'm so glad that, you know, when we celebrate the Lord's table, it's, it's all about, yeah, Jesus came for all of us, came for the many and the multitude. But at the same time, he just came for one. He, he came for you and he came for me. And as we take the, the bread, and we remember that's what his body was broken for, for us, for us. We're, we're a person. We're, a, we're not just a statistic or a, a number to Jesus. We are important to him. So as he took the bread, he broke it, gave thanks. He said, this is my body broken for you. Let's take and eat it together. Taken the cup, he said, this blood represents the new covenant. Let's take it and drink it in remembrance of him.
Father, we thank you. Thank you that you connect our lives, oh Lord, with people around us, Lord, every single day, every single day of this week coming, that you give us eyes to see those that are hungry, those that are thirsting, Lord. Thank you for bringing others around our lives when we were thirsting, Lord, that could point us to you, Lord, that living water, Lord. Thank you for the change that it's made in our lives, Lord, and the change that it will continue to make in the lives of others. We give you honor and praise, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for using our lives, Lord, to make a difference. In Jesus' name. What a great, great series this was. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to do some talking here because I like to throw everybody off because that's what I do. But <laughs> no, but um, I got a couple of things that I wanted to say that was going through my mind as, uh, as Pastor Jim was, was, was preaching uh, this message. And I don't know if you've all watched the, the series that we're, we're watching together because I'll be honest, um, at first... When I first heard about this series, I, I was like, no, it's going to be terrible. So I didn't, I didn't watch it. Not, not when, when Pastor Jim brought it up, but before. And, uh, but then he brought it up, and we we're going to watch it. I was like, oh, fine. So, but it's actually, it's been, uh, I don't want to use the term life-changing because it hasn't, like, I mean, that's pretty, pretty significant. But it's really impacted how I view Jesus. Um, and it's been, it's been extremely, it's been really good. Um, and in the messages today, uh, especially, but, but all, a lot of the messages, they, I can look back and see, well, how did, how did it visually look from the representation of, of the, the, the show that we're watching? And uh, it's just because all before <laughs> you kind of look in your child's eyes of how you've seen God as, as you grow up in Sunday school or, or, or the books that you read or, or anything like that. And in this one, you get to see a little bit of a different representation, which... Um, is very beneficial for, for me personally. So, um, and then that led me to think of the song that we're about to sing, and um, it's called Reckless Love, and you've heard it before, but I don't know if you know this, but there's, there's circles on the internet, which I, I try not to get involved in, but they, they pick this song to pieces, and they say, oh, how dare you say that God's reckless? How dare, like that, that's a negative word. And they totally miss the whole purpose of the song. Let's think about it. Let's look at Jesus, okay? To the Pharisees, Jesus was crazy. He was blasphemous and sacrilegious and everything that they were, um, <laughs> everything that they were, <laughs> in, in they, were, they were saying he was the opposite of, of what God wanted, but it was the opposite of that. And um, this song talks about how God's love is reckless. Yeah, in the eyes of, of what should happen and what the law says, it, it doesn't make any sense. But how can, how can what we fathom with this brain make sense with what God is doing? It doesn't, why would we think that we should be able to understand it? We can't because God is so much greater. And, and it talks, this song talks about, about uh, God kicking down walls and wouldn't do anything to to separate himself he would he would do everything he could to try to reach us and that's that's the story of the gospel <laughs> and it just blew my mind when i start hearing the message and i hear the the songs that that we sing and the ones that we're going to sing and sometimes they, they don't line up but today this one really spoke to me and it just because god would leave the 99 he did leave heaven to reach us i mean that's unreal it doesn't make any sense, and it's, it seems reckless, doesn't it? So it's not a negative thing. It's, it's everything. It's positive. It's the reason why we're here. So, yeah. So think about that. Think about how God, God, God would do the unthinkable for you, for me, for us. It's, uh, it's not a song. It's not, it's not just something that we sing about or talk about, then we go and we eat some food afterwards at, at our house. This is it's everything. <laughs> this is the reason why, why we meet. And, and yeah, it, it inspires you to go and talk to your friends and your neighbors and your coworkers. Um, not to preach at them, but to lead them to Jesus, just like, 
just like what happened in the, the show that we're watching. So, yeah, anyway, that's what I wanted to say. So, um, yeah, be mindful of that, that God, God loves you and he would do everything he can to reach you. So, yeah, that's pretty amazing.
fight still I'm found these are 99 and I couldn't earn it I don't deserve it still you give yourself away oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love God Thank you, God, for sending Jesus to this world to save us, bring us back to you. Thank you for your word. Let it encourage us, God. Encourage us to do what you've called us to do. that we are the chosen. God, that you chose us. You called us by name. And we give you glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to have a great day today. We're going to have a good Sunday, and we're going to be back next week ready to worship and to learn and see what God has to say. So have a good day. Be blessed. Amen.